President Tong, thank you so much. It's great to see you uh, by way of satellite. Uh, it's been great to visit with you in person. Thank you for joining us. And let me just start right off by asking you to uh, tell us, uh, as a former president serving several terms uh, in Kiribati, uh, how do you describe to the rest of the world the impact of the climate crisis on uh, Kiribati and other low-lying Pacific Island nations? Well, let me begin by saying how, how glad I am to be able to join you on this uh, wonderful program. And of course, uh, climate change has been an issue with which I've been involved, uh, not so much out of choice, but because it has become necessary. Uh, Kiribati is one of the countries I've just been listening to uh, the president of the Marshall Islands uh, talking. And uh, she, of course, ex uh, really explains exactly the same situation that we face in Kiribati. Being very low lying, we are very much subject to uh, any change in weather. And so uh, the problem we have experienced over the years has been the inundation, the erosion. Without uh, building seawalls, a lot of buildings will be gone. And so that has been the preoccupation in many, many families, many communities. And uh, there are village, there is a village that I know that uh, has actually been, it's no longer there. It has been relocated. And so this being in suggestions that uh, climate change was speculative, I can assure you by, it is by no means speculative as far as we're concerned. It has, it has touched the lives of people and it continues to do so. Every time we have a spring tide, every time we have a king tide, people are running around uh, trying to, to shore up their defenses so that their homes will not be affected. And of course, once they go, people begin to believe that it, it, it is no longer a problem, not realizing that what is coming is actually going to be a lot worse. And so food crops have been destroyed. We are also witnessing uh, changes in the weather pattern, and I believe that may be the more immediate uh, uh, danger that, that will face our communities. Not so much the rise in sea level, but the, the change in the weather pattern, the, the, the greater intensity and uh, uh, cyclones not uh, connecting according to pattern. Uh, we had in 2015 uh, cyclone Pam, which went north, and it, of course it flooded all of the islands of Tuolo. It uh, flooded our southern, southern islands, damaged homes, and uh, really it's beginning to, we're beginning to see a change from what, it, what we might have thought was uh, business as usual. So e even though uh, people think about Kiribati uh, as being primarily threatened by the rising seas, you are telling us that uh, you have an even more immediate threat with the change in precipitation patterns, rising temperatures, the disruption of uh, agriculture. Uh, is this having uh, an effect in your capital city of Tarawa? Well, in, in Tarawa, we have uh, perhaps one of the highest densi population densities anywhere in the world. And so the, the, the problem of what is happening with the weather, we have experienced flooding in the, in the island of uh, Tarawa. That's not usual. We don't, uh, we don't have that experience. But uh, as I said, it's, we, we don't see the sea level rise. But uh, what we are beginning to witness are more frequent uh, king tides. And so uh, the causeway that was built some years ago by the, the Japanese is no longer has got to be raised and it's just it's just in the process of being raised because the the waves are becoming to are beginning to overtop it and so there is that ongoing we our people continue to believe that these are the normal uh, this, this this is the normal cycle of events not realizing of course that um, because they do not read the reports the scientific reports so they don't know what is coming and indeed um, the, 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 uh, what I believe to be the more immediate concern will be the, the change in the weather pattern because being on the equator, we're not supposed to get the cyclones, the storms, but this is beginning to change. And so I see that because if we do have a storm, then uh, the islands do not, do not structure to withstand the storms. I know in the, that in Tuvalu during Cyclone Pam, there was a, a small island that was there before the storm, but by the, the time the storm was over, it's gone, it's no longer there. And wow. so that is what I see happening in the future. As now, when you were president, I remember this uh, vividly, 
Uh, you actually uh, passed legislation and negotiated the purchase of land in another country as a place of refuge for uh, families and communities in Kiribati who would have to move. And you worked out an arrangement with the nation of Fiji. But there must be a terrible emotional impact on people who leave their ancestral and spiritual home for so many generations. Uh, tell us uh, what that experience has been like. Well, let, let me say that um, the, the purchase of the land was done for many reasons. And of course, you have outlined some of the reasons. But one of the reasons that I did that was actually to make a very loud statement to the international community that this is coming. And uh, we didn't seem, we don't seem to be seeing anything coming forward to, to deal with it. Uh, certainly the, the, the discussions that had been ongoing, including uh, the Paris Agreement, did not deal with that because uh, as if you, if we go back to the science, the, the, pro the projections are that in spite of whatever uh, emission levels we might come to, including if, we, if the global community was to agree to a zero rise in, 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 in emissions, we will still be underwater. And so having that, having understood that uh, and acknowledged and uh, accepted that this is the science and we've got to be ready. And so this is the reason I, we, we went ahead to purchase the land. We had to put it through parliament. It, uh, there was questions about it. Of course, there is always the question that um, are, we, are we now actually talking about leaving our homelands? And I can assure you there's a lot of denial. There's a lot of, I faced, I, and I faced and continue to face a lot of criticism. And so some of the, the, uh, the, the measures what I, which I had put into place were not uh, taken in, it, in their entire, entirety by the incoming government. And so uh, the, the reality is nobody likes to come to, to acknowledge the reality, the very brutal reality that we may lose our homes. Nobody wants to, to think about that. And uh, one of the, the, biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest problems that I had to face was actually planning for the time when this would happen. And so that was uh, a, a, like a safety net if nothing else happens because we, nobody wants to leave their homeland. I mean, it's, a, it's an emotional issue, deeply emotional issue. Nobody likes to do that. And I think um, when I say this, uh, the, there is objection to it because people don't like to be, to be seen to be giving up and to be seen to be leaving uh, what has been there, all of there, as far as they know. So um, yes, it's not, a, it's not an easy issue, and it's a very difficult issue, including when uh, the Fijians realized that we'd bought land, the, the issue was actually raised in parliament. Why is Kiribati, the Kiribati government buying land? And, uh, but to their credit, the Fijians have since come forward, stepped forward, and said uh, Fiji would welcome the people from Kiribati and Tuvalu if ever they should need to migrate uh, due to the, 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 the sea level rise and climate change. Yeah, the Fijians are a wonderful people, uh, and President Bainamarama has been a, 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 an eloquent advocate for solving the climate crisis. And I think it's important for people in low-lying regions of wealthy developed countries, like the United States, for example, to listen carefully to what you are saying and what President mm -hmm. Heine was saying because there are large sections of Miami, Florida, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Galveston, Texas, just to pick a few examples, Annapolis, Maryland, where already uh, the king tides, the highest high tides, are covering many streets. And this is a, another form of exactly the threat that you're dealing with. And I thank you for your eloquent discussion of the difficult choice you have to make between relocation and adaptation, and you have given a new dimension to the word denial, uh, seeing it through the eyes of people who are uh, facing this existential threat. Uh, before we close, just uh, tell us right. uh, what you want the rest of the world to do. Well, uh, for one thing, I would, I would hope that they can undo what they have done. Uh, it's not an easy path, but I, it's, uh, the dealing with climate change has always been the greatest moral challenge. Yeah. That has been my definition of what climate change is. It's the greatest moral challenge facing humanity because 
it's not, it's not an economic argument, and uh, I've always rejected that it should be an economic argument. And so the question is, what are, what, what are we going to do when our home is gone? And uh, the question is, uh, should we be doing something about it, or should those that helped us lose that home do something about it? And let me say that our first choice has always been to build climate, re climate resilience so that we can continue to stay in our homeland. That has always been the first choice. There's been no question about it. But the, the, the problem is, how can we do it? It's going to require a huge amount of resource. And the question will be, will the global, the international community be able to come up with that? And failing that, what are our, what are our options? And I, I, in, when I was in office, and even as I, am, uh, do, con as I continue to advocate, I believe that we, can, we may be able to do it on our own. We have the resource base to do it. All we need to do, we have one of the largest fishery resources in the world. But the only problem is we get around 10% return on the value of that fish on the side of the wharf. We need to restructure that. And if we can do that, then we can uh, uh, build uh, our own climate resilience using the resources at our disposal. And so we need the, the international community to assist. There is not much, there's not a great deal that can be done in reversing the whole process. And as I said, our fate is already uh, pretty clear. Whatever happens, the momentum of the, the, the gases already in the atmosphere will continue to ensure that the, 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 the sea level will continue to rise, global temperatures will continue to rise. And so against that, faced with these uh, very difficult decisions, what we would welcome is the resources in order to build the climate resilience. And failing that, the, and I, I believe that it is, it is also inevitable that we may have to relocate some of our people. Yeah. And I've always advocated a policy of migration with dignity, not, my, not um, climate refugees, but our people to migrate with dignity. Because having lost their home, the last thing that we, wish, we would wish to see them lose is their dignity as well. Well, thank you for your eloquence and thank you for your leadership. Uh, it's certainly true, as you've eloquently stated, that some of the impacts are going to continue uh, regardless of what the world does. But if we stop adding to the overburden of these gases trapping so much heat, we can limit uh, the yes. future impacts that would become utterly catastrophic for the entire world. So thank you for your leadership, Mr. President, and thank you for being a part of 24 Hours of Reality.